It'll even come back with results, how many matches or how many verses there are for a particular phrase that you would input a particular word. In some electronic Bibles, the King James Version, you enter the following, and this is what you get. You enter the phrase, fear not, and it gives you 169 verses. You enter the phrase, be not afraid, and it yields 79 verses. The phrase, have no fear, shows 25 verses. The phrase, shall not fear, another 55 verses. The phrase, do not fear, gives you another 37 verses. What is the total number of verses warning not to fear throughout the Word of God? 365 total verses, one for every day of the year. But wait, there's more. Add the phrase, do not worry. And that certainly exposes one more verse for a grand total of 366 verses, just enough to cover leap year for those who are scoring at home. So consider this. Despite 40 authors writing 66 books from three continents over a nearly 2,000 year period, and God was still able to get the message to us to fear not every day of the year. Fear not. Every day of the year, fear not. Even keeping in mind leap year. That is pure genius. That's the God that we serve. Uh, through all of that, the mathematical probability of that is, is just astounding. Yet God has taken care of business to keep us comforted. At some time, at some <laughs> level, everyone has been gripped with fear. Perhaps a loved one lingered in the balance of life and death. Perhaps you were momentarily inundated with fear, uncertain of their survival. Maybe one of your children experienced a crisis that unsettled, every, unsettled everyone until it played itself out. Maybe you were physically threatened or you lost your job and for a while you battled fear. What are we going to do? John said, fear has torment. How many know fear has torment? And in a time like this, Fear will have more victims than the coronavirus. Yep. Time like this, fear will cause us to make bad decisions. It will cause us to be gripped in a state we don't have to be in. Fear has torment. And there's a lot of Americans tormented today. Whatever your fears may have been, one fact is certain. You weren't alone. Everyone, everybody has encountered fear. And Jesus knew we would. In our text, 60 years after his crucifixion, Jesus returned to John on the Isle of Patmos and made his greatest statement regarding his conquest of fear. Revelation 1, 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and the grave, of Hades and death. Christ has conquered the greatest enemies of our soul, death and hell. But that still doesn't prevent people from ignoring these words and living fearfully. Yeah. Fear enfolds the earth. This planet is besieged by fear. Governments grip whole nations in fear. Mm -hmm. There is a fear uh, of what we do know, of what we don't know, of what we might not know, of what might come. There's a fear of the past a fear of the present, and a fear of the future. And there's a scope of fear that is broad. Some time ago, a report noted that up to 77% of a person's cumulative thoughts are negative. 77% of your thoughts are likely negative. Mm. It's no wonder because uh, children raised in an average American <coughs> household hear the word no 
or they're told what they cannot do nearly 150,000 times yeah. by the age 18. It's not always wrong to say no, but parents should exercise caution or they can negatively program their children and unintentionally instill a spirit of fear. So much fear that the child might be even afraid to go forward in life lest they hear the word no. One doctor stated that there is an epidemic of fear and worry in this country, and that is scary. And this is long before, this was said long before the coronavirus has gripped our nation. One headline uh, in the news today said, America is empty. And they showed empty stores, empty shelves, uh, uh, empty streets, uh, empty neighborhoods. Uh, and, you know, the weather's getting nicer. Uh, there are areas where children are playing in the driveway, in the front yard, in the streets, uh, as we did, and all completely empty for fear of coronavirus. Amen. So, at one time, Clemson University in North Carolina was plagued with a flu epidemic that struck 4,000 of the 11,000 students. When sicknesses are described as epidemic, they spread far and wide. This describes the plague of fear that's infected people today. It's reached epidemic proportions. The coronavirus hysteria is killing us even without infecting us. Yeah. 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 Amen. Oh, yeah. And those people that write on Facebook, how dare a church remain open? <coughs> My wife today said the, the governor of, the, and, and, uh, of Ohio that has closed all of the restaurants, all of the bars. Uh, who thought that's all you had to do to close the bars? I thought it would take a lot more prayer than that. And they just closed it <laughs> in a day. They closed all the restaurants and all the bars. And Marjean told me, he said, they're asking that to be a first-rate citizen, you must stay in your home. It's your civic duty, they said. Sadly, I'm not in my home right now. I'm preaching the word of God in church. And we're all here. Amen. And, and my church, is, a good part of my church is here. <laughs> Amen. See, coronavirus hysteria is killing us without even infecting us with fear. Fear is no respecter of persons. It grips people of the Middle East that are constantly bombarded with acts of terrorism. To those living in the famine riddled nations of Africa. To the uncertain Wall Street investor. To the wife of a husband that's working nights. No one is immune from fear. Despite its widespread influence, the Bible says Christians should not tolerate fear. We're not to tolerate it because fear is the very enemy that Jesus came to conquer. Are you hearing me tonight? Yes. Jesus came to conquer fear. Two words that are repeated throughout the word of God that warn Christians to ignore fear and to trust God. And those two words are fear not. When God directed Abraham, the father of our faith, into a new way, he said in Genesis 15, 1, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. To Isaac, he spoke the same words in Genesis 26, verse 24. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. Again, in Isaac, uh, in Isaiah, the Lord said uh, in 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And God used these words to comfort every single Christian in 2 Timothy. Verse 1, 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen. Consider this, you can eliminate 99% of your fears when you understand that God is all-powerful. God is sovereign. God is good. God never loses control of anything. He, he won't allow anything to touch you without it first passing through his hand. That means if you're going to catch the coronavirus, it'll first pass through the hands of God to you. 
because he's got your back. He's upholding you in his right hand. Are you hearing me? Amen. He's not Amen. giving us the spirit of fear. He's giving us instead power and love and a sound mind. Amen. Uh, praise God. And he won't allow that. Uh, amen. He always uh, makes all things work together for the good for those that love God. One man said, fear knocked at the door. Faith answered and nobody was there. When you think about it, non-Christians have a legitimate right to fear. Legitimate. Unbelievers fear falling into the hands of evil men. Unbelievers fear death and disease, and they should. But Christians understand the transcendent. They understand the umbrella of protection of God and his people. The perfect peace, health, and eternal life that awaits us in heaven beyond this life. We don't fear because there's nothing the enemy can do to us without going through the hands of God. Unbelievers fear death. Unbelievers fear destruction. Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Amen. Let's talk about the conquest of fear. Psalms 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? How can I be afraid of a virus when God is the stronghold of my life? When God is my life and my salvation? Amen. When God is my hope and my sustenance? When God is my future, my destiny, and my perfection? Amen. That's God. How can anybody fear anything the world has? Amen. I didn't believe this was some phony self-confident boast that David made in Psalms 27. David looked directly to God for his confidence. God was the light he needed for guidance. God was the grace he needed for deliverance. The refuge he needed for protection. And the power he needed for conquering. Light, grace, refuge, and power. Trust me. David knew whereof he speaks. He did some conquering in his life. Come on, somebody. He understood the need for refuge. He knew protection. And we need to make the same pronouncement tonight. We need to get consumed with God's word. We need to stand on this. Amen. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And no deadly thing shall harm us. See, when we faithfully do that, we will become what we stand on. If we would stand on God's word, if we would consume this word and stand on it, then we become that which we stand on. So what is that? What is it that people fear in this life? Three common fears, quickly. People fear the mysteries of life. We wrestle with fear when we're faced with perplexities of the unknown. I'm just like most of you in that I want to know the answers to dilemmas and mysteries. I like to dig deep into things I don't understand, but that doesn't always happen. Principal investors make the stock market work for them. Successful Wall Street investors are experts at anticipating the direction of the market. They know when to raise, when to hold, and when to fold. Sometimes Christians think knowing our future or unraveling life's mysteries are the key to a peaceful and abundant life, but that's incorrect. It's not the key to anything. It might be beneficial. It might be advantageous, but it's not a key. Victory for Christians isn't contingent on solving the mystery of tomorrow. We cannot always predict the future. But we know what the will of God is, don't we? The will of God is trusting him because he will never leave us nor forsake us. God's will for us is to believe that with God all things are possible. And that his will is that none should perish. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And God's yeah. will for us is to understand that his ways and his thoughts are infinitely higher than ours. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor 
are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Amen. The message here is simple. God is never mystified. He's never duped. He's never confused. You might be, but he is not. Mm -hmm. Amen? He's not confused by the coronavirus. It didn't catch him by surprise. He's not, it's not out of control in his hands. He can gather it up in a split nanosecond breath. A word. It can be gone from here forever. That's who God we serve. That's who we serve. Amen. So why can we run around in Philadelphia and fear? That's who we serve. God is always in control. There was no chaos with God. There may be a lot with you and me, <laughs> but he always has a plan. Sometimes life is like a scattered jigsaw puzzle. I used to do jigsaw, do jigsaw puzzles when I was younger. We think, what a task, wow. Connecting the pieces is impossible. I'm not sure how it'll happen. Uh, you know how I was taught to piece together a jigsaw puzzle? It's very simple. The first step was to open the box and pour them all out, all the pieces out, and, and turn them right side up. From there, you found the corner pieces, and when there are two straight edges, and you set them in place. After that, you set the sides of the puzzle, and then you work inward. Over time, the puzzle would start to take shape and uh, be assembled one piece at a time and begin to make sense of the whole picture. And we begin to uh, put the pieces together. And as we see more of the final outcome, we begin to be more confident that we're going to get there. Life is like that. No matter how overwhelming the puzzle of life appears, God is the one that placed it before us. And your first order of business, church, is to deal with what's inside the box. That is what's inside your heart. Jesus must be the Lord of your heart, your attitudes, and your desires. Keep your heart filled with his love. Next, work with the obvious pieces of life. Set the four corners of faith, righteousness, peace, and joy. Set the four corners, the standards, the anchors, Set those in place. What are you going to live by? Are you going to live by the four corners? That's what you're going to live by. Everything else will fall in that scope. So those four corners of your jigsaw puzzle called life, those four corners must be what you determine your life to live by. Next word, uh, then, then you're going to work with all the pieces of life that God providentially places into your hands. Amen. That maybe you're making the edges. There may be setting the destiny and the direction for the rest of your life. You may twist and turn them for a while, but eventually you'll position them. Eventually you'll find where these pieces of your life belong and what direction you are supposed to be going. And in the end, because as, as you begin to, to uh, you, get your, you get your pieces in line, you get your edges, you get your corner standards, your corner pieces in line, you begin to put the middle of your life together, it begins to fall in place. And in the end, regardless of the difficulty uh, during the process, you'll see God put it together one piece at a time, and ultimately it will be finished. And that's how God has us handle life. One piece at a time. That's why Jesus says with confidence, fear not. Secondly, people fear difficulty. Difficulty and pressure can be overwhelming. And there are many tough challenges to bear in life. Single mothers struggle to raise their children. Young people struggle with financial problems. Young people are also concerned with uh, uh, where they'll continue their education, who they'll marry, what career field to go into. Thousands of people have committed suicide because they couldn't take any more. But the fact is that God has created us and he knows our load limit. He knows who you are. He knows what you can manage and what is too much for you. And he will not overburden us. He will take control. We may still have the burdens, but he will lift the load. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will. 
will give you rest. I will carry your yoke. That's what he's promising. That's what he's telling you. He goes, here, you take my yoke, which is sin-free, which is easy, which is a blessing, and I will take your yoke. And we'll walk this walk together. Sin, however, overburdens us at times. A church member called me some time ago. Her first words were, I can't take it anymore. Her words were garbled. She was obviously upset, had been crying, hardly intelligible. So I asked her to repeat herself. I can't take it anymore, she said starkly. I said, sister, that's actually not a bad place to be. She was shocked for me to hear it then on the phone, almost like I'll pass her. And just going to tell me just to suck it up. That's what she thought I was going to do. And I said, it's not a bad place to be because if you can't, if you can't take it anymore, then your trial is over because now God must move in and he must take over at this point because God can, there, there's no trial that he will allow to just overwhelm you unto death. Am I right? Amen. Amen. There's something to be learned on the trial. And if it is too much to bear, he'll have to come in and the trial will end. God will need to move in. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation, will also make a way of escape. Come on. And you may be able to bear it. God won't overload you with what you can't manage. And that's God's promise to you. If your load limit is maxed out, it's over. God is about to take away the trial. God is about to move in and take charge. Amen. Thank God. Because when we can't take it anymore, the first thing you can do is cry out to God. God, I can't take this anymore. Wendy did that. And it all came to a head about a month ago, two months ago. And then her husband started contacting her. For three years. God is good. God knows how much you can take and what you can't. When Jesus calms the storm in Mark chapter 4, their boat was spinning. Death appeared imminent. And Jesus was sleeping. <laughs> they woke him with these words, don't you care if we drown? Of course he cares if you drown. But us and our self-pity, we like to put the guilt trip on thinking that somehow guilt tripping Jesus, he'll do what we need him to do for us. I don't think you can guilt trip Jesus. Don't you care if we drown? The problem was they forgot his words before launching. Hey. Let's go over to the other side. Not, hey, let's go drown in the middle. Right? When he says, let's go to the other side, what do you think Jesus is going to meet you at? On the other side. Amen? He assured them of a successful mission. Didn't matter how much the boat rocked. Didn't matter how much water got in. Didn't matter how it reeled or how loud the storm howled. They were going to make it to the other side. That's the promise of God. You and me, we are going to make it to the other side. This may describe your situation. Maybe you're battling a raging storm right now. The tempest has ripped the sails right off your vessel. But if Christ is your Savior, He's in the storm with you. He's able to calm the storm for you on your behalf. And the day is coming when Jesus will arise. He will raise his hand. He will speak the word. Calm the storm. And everything will be all right. In the coronavirus world, everything will be all right. A time when Jesus will stand up for America, who provides 95 to 98% of the missionaries all over the world. It's America that has evangelized the world. And God will stand up for us. And God will stand up. And God will say no more to coronavirus. God will say no more to gripping America by fear. And he will step in. And he will make that change. Never doubt that. Amen. He will make everything right. The tempest will cease. He will say peace. Be still. And everything changes. That's a God we serve. The Bible 
Bible says the ship settled and there was a great calm. Mark says when this happened, the disciples were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I like that. The storm was over. The winds had ceased. The lake was peaceful, but they were terrified. At him. Who's this guy? Even the wind and the, and the waves obey him. Who should they fear more, the tempest or the one who calmed the tempest? Who should be feared more, Pharaoh's army or the one that parted the Red Sea and swallowed that army? Who should fear, be feared more, the Amorites uh, at Ai or the one that stopped the sun length of the day and gave Joshua the victory? Who should we fear more, the coronavirus or the God that can stop it with a spoken word? Yes. Snap of his hand. Thirdly, as I close, people fear death. Ultimately, that's what's behind almost every motivation. Almost every panicked run to the emergency room, almost every freaked out moment in our family's life has been a, a health issue, uh, something that, you know, my daughter's first malaria, we've only been there two weeks, she's got malaria, I, I, there's a lot of myths about malaria, I didn't understand, I was freaking out, the enemy was lying to me. Remember the story I told you? I'm pacing back and forth. She's in the hotel room. The doctor's there. And she's trying to treat her. And she's she's all fevered up. She's sweating. She's delirious. Uh, and she's got a headache, a pounding. And, 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 I, and the devil's lying to me. And you're going to have revival, but, but your daughter's going to die. Your daughter's going to die, but don't worry. That, that death is going to bring you revival. And this is the enemy. And I'm going back and forth. No, I, I'm not willing. And I felt convicted like somehow if I, if I didn't relent and say, okay, take my daughter, that somehow I was not being a, 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 a faithful Christian. And breaking through the tempest, breaking through the storm in my head, in a moment of time was God's voice saying, my son already died for your revival. I don't need your daughter. I'll never forget that. And I knew right then that she was going to be okay. In fact, within 30 minutes, her fever had broken and she was fine. She had the medicine. People fear death. Some people are so afraid of dying, they can hardly even live. They refuse to fly in airplanes because they might crash. I knew a grown man that would hardly eat anywhere but his mother's kitchen because he feared being poisoned, really. Boy, that's a serious complex. To him, it was a dreadful thing to eat any other place. One man said, I'm a frightened child in the face of death. Christians should have no fear of death because 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. The only person justified for fearing death is the unsaved because there's no second chance. There's no reviving hope for the unsaved. For anyone that refuses Jesus Christ as their Savior, there is no hope at that moment. There's no forgiveness for the, for the final rejection of Christ going from this world into that one. All opportunity for salvation is lost. Revelation 21 verse 8, but the cowardly Unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Jesus took away the fear of death three days after the cross when he stood outside the empty tomb. He took care of the fear of death. He said to every Christian, amen, amen, though you shall die, yet shall you live. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. Death didn't conquer Christ. He conquered death. And he's remained victorious over the grave for more than 2,000 years. And that's the confidence that we have. You and me right now. He said no matter what happens, we are in the hands of the Savior who loves us, enough to die for us, enough to be, be hung on the cross when he could have simply called a, 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 a
legion of angels to come down and snatch him from the, the jaws of those evil men. But instead he said, no. Alex is in my mind. He's going to need me one day. I'm dying for him. Chris, I'm dying for her. Aaron, she's going to cry out to me. And if I don't die right now, I won't be able to be there for her. And I will be there for her. That's the God that we serve. No need to fear. Let's bow our heads. There's no need to fear mysteries because Christ is your wisdom. No need to fear being abandoned because he is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. No need to fear being defenseless, church, because Josiah. Hebrews 13, 6 declares, we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid of what man can do to me. There's no need to fear when you are without strength and nothing is impossible. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, you're not right with God, would you like to give your life to Jesus Christ? And now is the time. There's never been a greater moment in the history of the earth than right now for you to get your life right with God. For you to say once and for all, you know, I've had it with this world, and the world over promises and under delivers, and I've had just about enough of that. And it is time to become what I was intended to be from the very beginning. If you're not saved, you've never yet lived your best life. Because you're living a lie. The world has raised you to believe a lie. But God didn't predestine you to walk in his shadow and his glory. And to walk a particular path for your life all the way to his kingdom. So if you're not saved, you're not born again, you're not right with God, you're not forgiven, you can be so tonight. You just simply respond to the God of heaven. Your eyes are closed, your head is bowed, and Jesus is speaking to your heart of hearts. He's knocking at your heart's door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and opens the door, I will come into him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. Are you ready to sup with Christ the King? If you want to give your life to Jesus right now, you say these words with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me and rose from the dead. I need you to forgive me, Lord. I give you my life, and I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. From this point forward, give me the strength to follow you, to be yours, to walk in your footsteps, to allow my life to be governed by the King of Kings. Lord, I give you my life right now. I will turn away from this wicked world, and I will follow you all the way to your kingdom from this point forward. I pray this. I covenant with you right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that for the first time, in our live stream, you said that prayer, and you meant it. Contact us on Facebook or on our website, PottersHouseOhio.com, and we'll gladly send you some resources that you will need to make this walk from here to his kingdom. Thank you very much, Lord bless. Church, we have got to break the spirit of fear. We've got to cast down fear in this nation. We've got to be a church that comforts those that are struggling, we have to be a people that will speak words of life to those that are running away. We have to allow God to give us the strength to be that lighthouse for 
the lost, the giant world, this altar's open, you come and find a place to pray.